Good evening and welcome to The Breakdown, brought to you by The Lincoln Project. I am Tara Setmayer. This is the Rick Wilson. And tonight we have a great show for you coming up. Um, last night we had our CPAC recap special and um, joined by our good friend Anthony Scaramucci. And, you know, lots to, lots to digest right after CPAC was over. Um, but tonight <laughs> there's even more to digest because little did we know most people didn't know there was a shadow conference going on during CPAC as if CPAC wasn't enough. There was <laughs> <Right>. something else, <laughs> even worse, called AFPAC, which we're going to talk to one of our experts later on, Eric Ward, friend of the show. Um, he is an expert in um, conspiracy theories, extremism. Um, he is the executive director of the Western States Center in Oregon. So stay tuned for him. He'll be our first guest tonight to talk all about that. It's it's fascinating and terrifying at the same time. And also right. we'll be joined later by another friend of the show, Jennifer Marcia. She is a professor and an author. She's an expert in rhetoric and wrote the book Demagogue for President. Um, she is amazing. And we're going to talk about Trump's rhetoric at CPAC and what the Republicans are talking and how this is impacting our national dialogue, because um, there's a lot going on there from Josh Hawley to Ted Cruz to some of the others. Um, so Jen's going to be here to break it all down for us a little later in the show. And as always, we want to hear from you. So make sure you send us your questions at hashtag ask the breakdown on Twitter. There it is. Hashtag ask the breakdown. Send us your questions and we will answer some of them throughout the show. And we have decided to go back to the old school. You can leave us a voicemail. We have the number. There it is. Give us a call, leave a message, and um, if as long as it's not crazy and offensive, we might play it later on in the show. So there it is. And even if it uh, is crazy and offensive, we yes, might play it on the perhaps, show. Perhaps. <laughs> it depends on the level of crazy and offensive. Uh, we're not afraid of it. We just don't want to subject you people to it as well. <laughs> um, so, Rick, um, you know, I am, I'm reminded every day um, as we go through the process of monitoring what's going on in this country, reading up on what's happening in, in, in the states, on the local level, also what's happening here in D.C. for me on my end. Sure. And there's a lot coming out of Republicans and Trump Trumpsters and, and those folks that really does not represent who we are as Americans. And today, the Lincoln Project put out one, I want to say, one of the best ads out of the many Wonderful ads that you guys have, have produced on uh, over there on the creative side. Um, but this latest one, I think, is top notch, up there with Morning in America. And um, I want to share it with our audience and talk about it afterwards. Take a look. Donald Trump is not done dividing America. He's come out of hiding to find his old friend, the spotlight. On Sunday, he took the stage at the Conservative Political Action Conference in Orlando, Florida where he lobbed insults, spread conspiracies, and lied. This election was rigged. And the, the same things he's done for four years, with no concern for the destruction he leaves behind. He'll get the attention he craves. After all, even condemning him feeds his insatiable need to be seen. Which is why it's more important than ever to remind ourselves that in November, one thing became clear. America is not Donald Trump. America is the people whose names you may never hear, whose only fame will be among those whose lives they touch, but who are the best of America, all the same. They're doctors, nurses, healthcare workers, the people working tirelessly to get every American vaccinated against COVID-19. They're the disaster relief workers and first responders holding up their Texas neighbors during the harshest winter the state has ever seen. They're the people who show up, lend a hand, and give a damn when their fellow Americans are in need. Remember them. The lives they lead are the best proof that Trump 
is a liar. Because America's greatness comes from us, not him. The Lincoln Project is responsible for the content of this advertising. America's greatness comes from us, not from him. Rick Wilson, bravo. Talk to us about how this ad came to be. You know, Tara, we were watching this weekend and we were thinking a lot about, you know, what are you seeing up there? It's the usual Trump, you know, I made the world. I did everything. It's me, me, me all the time. And for all that Trumpism is going to be a long running threat to us, there is something that fundamentally I, sh I think should offend every American. And that is that this man tries to take credit for the greatness in our people in this country and for the work they do and for the, for the passion they show for the lives of others around them. And it, we really thought it was necessary to remind folks that greatness is within all of us and, and, and the courage and dedication uh, that people have been showing in every walk of life during the, this, this last four years and the last few months particularly. Look, the last few months have been very hard in this country. We saw an, an attempted coup that almost overthrew our government. We saw the, a disease that was ignored and, and mishandled for over a year kill 500,000 Americans. We saw this great sense that, that the, the poison and the drift and the sickness that defined everything about Donald Trump's administration was, was pushing America down. And all I could think of was, you know, we need to remind people that they're the ones, they're the heroes, they're the stars, they're the, they're the people who will touch lives in ways that this callow, mean little man never could. And so it's just a sort of a love note to America right now at a time where things have been tough and where it would be tempting to let the, the, the down note of Trump returning to the stage you know, put us back in a position where we forget that this country roundly rejected this man because, not because of politics, but because America's good fundamentally, and he's not. And they made that choice. That's right. Because here, right still matters, as our friend Lieutenant Colonel Vinman said. Um, well, yep. well done. Well done. And I'm, I'm so thrilled that uh, we're always able to share with our audience your great work. And um, so, yes. So if you like it, keep supporting us because that's what you're going to get from the Lincoln Project. And on that note, uh, some good news. We have some good news. And it's on the vaccination front. Um, even though it's been very difficult for a lot of folks to get vaccines, um, there is a plan. The rollout is has accelerated since the Biden administration has taken office. And we all know that the Johnson & Johnson vaccine has now been approved and is being distributed as we speak. So that is good. Uh, the Biden administration said that all adult Americans should be able to have access to the vaccine by the end of May, which is two months earlier than they originally projected. So that is great news. Let's let's hope that that stays on track. Uh, something sure. else that was that was pretty extraordinary today is that uh, Merck, who is normally a competitor of Johnson and Johnson, um, agreed to help manufacture more of the vaccine to help boost supply faster. This is historic. Nothing like this has happened. Uh, it's unprecedented. This is like right. what happened during World War II when, you know, companies and industries banded together to help in the war effort to produce goods. Um, it's pretty, this is what we should have seen a year ago, frankly, Rick. I mean, imagine yeah, if we, we had seen this level of collaboration and coordination a year ago, we wouldn't be here right now, I suspect. But it's reassuring that it's actually correct. happening now. Thank God. And shout out to do to two. Jersey companies, <laughs> Merck and Johnson and Johnson, <laughs> Jersey, step well, it up again. <laughs> you know, Tara, one of the points here is it, it's a very simple point. How did that happen? It happened because of leadership from the White House. That's right. It happened because of leadership from this president. It didn't happen in under Donald Trump because they were too busy having the Jared Kushner, you know, viral Wanse conference saying, how should we punish <laughs> the blue states that don't like Trump? It didn't happen because Donald Trump lied for three months saying, oh, it's going away, it's disappearing, it's not going to kill anybody. It didn't happen then because, you know, she had Sean Hannity on Fox News with a Chiron one night that said number of Americans killed by COVID, zero. Weirdly, he never updated that Chiron. I, it's strange, but, but what you saw here is one of the fundamental differences between somebody who leads as, as a servant leader and someone who 
believed that people were there just to serve him and his ego. And it yep. is enormously gratifying to see how Joe Biden is pushing and, and nudging the system to get it working. I mean, we're talking about having enough vaccines in May to inoculate every adult American. And if he accomplishes that, that is a, beyond politics. That is an accomplishment that will save tens of millions of lives. That's right. And if we had gone and kept on the path of Trump, we would have, you know, add a zero to that number we've already faced right now. Like, uh, Rick, I just want to take a second to think about that. Could you imagine if Donald Trump was still president, where we would be right now? I, I, I mean, oh. I shudder to think <sighs> because just it, w- it would be Texas, right? We heard what happened today. Uh, the idiot governor of Texas um, and the other one in Mississippi announcing that we're lifting all the mask mandates. No more. You don't have to wear a mask. Businesses are 100 percent open, acting as if we're still not in the middle of a freaking pandemic. People are still dying. There are variants out there. This is not a time to let up. This isn't a time. They only have 6% of their population vaccinated in Texas. It's not like Texas is like, well, we're like 90% vaccinated. We can open up again. No. And here they are doing this. They're anti-science, taking 10 steps back. We were taking two steps forward. And now Texas and Mississippi are taking 10 steps back in this COVID-19 fight when the rest of us are trying to do the right thing. And if Donald Trump had still been president, that would have been God knows how many other states and who knows where we would be with the vaccine rollout right now. I, I shudder to think of it. Well, so thank God Joe Biden is president. Well, you know, one of the things about the vaccine rollout, the little, little piece of news that bubbled up today, it turns out that although Donald Trump, while he was president, mm-hmm. never encouraged vaccination. OK, he kept pretending you could take hydroxychloroquine or you could put bleach in your ass or you could you could use you know lasers up your butt or whatever the hell he was talking about but it didn't encourage vaccination well guess what melania and donald trump were vaccinated against COVID while they were still in the white house that's right january so a hearty fuck you mr president uh, mr former president um because the idea that you, the, the, the hypocrisy of it is so much on brand for Trump. You know, it's always, I'm the man of the people, I love you. But you know his contempt just drips out of every pore. And, and, and you know his contempt is perfectly manifest by being a vaccine skeptic and a mask skeptic, but getting vaccinated right. while he's in the White House. It's just, it, 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 it was yep. a coda to a whole catalog of dickishness. <laughs> that, that he engaged in. Uh, little dickishness that he engaged in. Yes, indeed. Um, and it's just another example of the, the level of absolute hypocrisy that comes out of Donald Trump and his people. I, it, it, it is remarkable. But yes, so to all the, what are all the QAnon and, and anti-vaxxers and anti-maskers that Donald Trump was their hero? What do they say now? They probably don't believe he really did it. He's just lying or he's just telling well, people that, uh, uh, you know, just just to go along just to because there's a whole plot. I'm sure there's there's some kind of QAnon <laughs> thing that, that it was some kind of super, <laughs> you know, Jewish space laser uh, that was shot down to give Donald Trump, you know, immunity to who knows. These people are lunatics. But, uh, Tara, there was there was an article today about on the QAnon boards. So they're like, oh. Trump being vaccinated is code word for military arrests of all the people <laughs> against him. I'm like, I see, I didn't even know on. that. I didn't even know come that. Come on, and these people are so, and now so we do. predictable. They're they're so predictable. Um, we were. I, I was going to mention another deplorable Trumper, um, but I'm actually not even going to give her any airtime because I cannot stand her that much. I'll just give you a hint. She's blonde. She's a bimbo. She lied a lot, and she got hired by Fox News and used to work for Trump. Next subject. Yeah, her. Next one. I am one. shocked to hear this. <laughs> Kaylee Mendacity gets a job with Fox? How could it have happened? Oh, God. That's all the airtime I'm giving that twit. So that's a serious <laughs> business. Um, <laughs> the FBI director, Christopher Wray, was up on Capitol Hill testifying today. Um, and, of course, this is uh, a se- the second hearing this week that talked about what happened on January 6th. And... If you guys are loyal LPTV watchers, you know that this is an issue that we are not going to just skip over. Um, There was a violent insurrection that killed people on January 6th. 
Our Capitol was ransacked. Our lawmakers were hiding for their lives. The vice president was hiding for his life because there was a rabid mob outside chanting, hang Mike Pence. That happened in America. And there were members of Congress who helped foment this, who are now trying to whitewash history when it was only a few weeks ago, we all saw it, but they're trying to act like it didn't happen or that it wasn't Trump supporters. Um, but yet, as the professionals continue to come and speak under oath or you know, at hearings discussing what took place, it is clear that it was Trump supporters who did this. But yet, you have senators out there and members of Congress continuing to push the other part of this big lie, that it was actually fake Trump supporters, it was Antifa and BLM masquerading as Trump supporters uh, engaged in this ransacking of the Capitol, this insurrection. Well, the FBI director today said that was a bunch of bullshit. He didn't say that, but he said it a lot more articulately. He said, no, that, there's no evidence of that. And he admitted that domestic terrorism is a threat and one of the biggest ones to this country, again. So let's take a look at some of the things he had to say. That attack, that siege, was criminal behavior, plain and simple, and it's behavior that we, the FBI, view as domestic terrorism. It's got no place in our democracy, and tolerating it would make a mockery of our nation's rule of law. The rule of law, of course, is our country's bedrock, and it's our guiding principle at the FBI. That's why the FBI has been working day and night across the country to track down those responsible for the events of January 6th and to hold them accountable. The FBI is committed to seeing this through, no matter how many people it takes or how long or the resources we need to get it done. Because as citizens, in a sense, we're all victims of the January 6th assault and the American people deserve nothing less. Unfortunately, as you noted, Mr. Chairman, January 6th was not an isolated event. The problem of domestic terrorism has been metastasizing across the country for a long time now, and it's not going away anytime soon. It ain't going away anytime soon. It was not an isolated nope. incident, you idiots. And stop trying to make it as such as if it were something random and, and that it was one, you know, I was just at one time. No. This is a growing problem. It is metastasizing throughout our country. And he said that there were 2,000 cases so far uh, opened on this. And uh, I think there were field offices at 50, what, what was the number? It was something like over 50 I field think it was offices 56 are involved in this. Out of 53 yeah. out of 56 or something. It was some remarkable number. Apparently, no yeah. one from Guam made it to the Capitol, but you know, here we are. <laughs> right. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's just remarkable. And anyone who, who is a reasonable person knows who these people are and the types of people that they are. Sure. And that these white nationalists, these militia groups, these supremacists, these authoritarian wannabes, um, they are a danger and they're out there and they're emboldened. And um, which leads me to our next guest, because we're going to talk about wh how, why and how some of them feel about this and, and what it is, you know, they're, they're gathering more. It, they used to be in the fringe. Now they're gathering more at, you know, open conferences and things. So I think it's a good, uh, good segue to bring in our next guest, Eric Ward. There he is. He Eric. is muted. He's... Hi, Eric. You're muted. <laughs> I think we had this problem last time I was muted. Tara and Rick, it's great to see you both. <laughs> No Likewise, problem, good Eric. to see you. Thanks for coming back. <laughs> glad to I'm have glad you back. Glad to be with you. Um, what so a the time. audience knows. I know what a time to be alive. Um, for the audience who did not have the opportunity to see you last time, let me properly introduce you. Eric Ward is okay. a nationally recognized expert on the relationship between authoritarian movements, hate violence, and preserving democracy. He is the executive director of the Western States Center and a senior fellow with the Southern Poverty Law Center and race forward. And he is here with us again tonight to talk about this shadow conference that was going on, which I didn't get as much coverage as CPAC. Thankfully, actually, I'm kind of glad that we didn't um, amplify this too much. But the reason why we're talking about it tonight is because um, there weren't just the fringe elements there. There was a member of Congress there who was the keynote. That would be Representative uh, Paul Gozar from Arizona. And a former 
Congressman Steve King of Iowa. Um, they were there at this conference. It was the America First Conference. And I'm going to show a little recap and then we'll talk about it on the other side. My name is Nicholas J. Fuentes, and I believe that the people of the United States have a right to self-determination. My reason for going down to Charlottesville over the weekend was to show solidarity for a cause which has not been talked about in the mainstream media. The Republican Party has failed us. What can you and I do to a state legislator besides kill him? Here's Nicholas Fuentes. That if the GOP would not do everything in their power to keep Trump in office, then we would destroy the GOP. I rise up for myself and 60 of my colleagues to object to the uh, counting of the electoral ballots from Arizona. Our elected representative from Washington, Paul Gosar, came out and his response to the group was just flat out, we're in it. We just haven't started shooting at each other yet. Imagine this, that you get a stick, go back home once we conquer the hill. Donald Trump has returned from being president. What did you and Ali Alexander talk about? I was the person who came up with the January 6th idea with Congressman Gosar, Congressman Mo Brooks, and then Congressman Andy Biggs. President Trump signed seven of my bills into law, making me one of the most effective members of Congress, the most effective Republican. We have a climate crisis, but it's not about the moon and the oceans. We have a climate crisis of intolerance, a climate crisis of communists who suppress free speech, suppress our votes, suppress our citizens in favor of aliens, and undermine our republic. We are the Americans, and America is the home of the Americans. That's what it means to be America. America is one people, one nation, on this continent, forged over hundreds of years by shared experiences, descended from an English cultural framework and influenced by European civilization. You know, that, that line is, that Nick Fuentes was doing there, the one people want that, that sort of Ein Volk, Ein Reich, it sounds familiar to me somewhere. I just can't. <laughs> Jesus Christ. I know. It's, it's, it's people, it's scary to think that there are people out here like this. And not only that, but they're being, they're being given platforms. And he's clearly sure. emboldened, right? This guy is no longer on the fringe. And... Um, for those who don't know, Eric, please tell us who the hell is this Nick Fuentes and why should we care? Uh, yeah, Nick Fuentes uh, frames himself as an uh, American far right uh, political commentator. I, I think it's, it's more accurate to call him a propagandist. Uh, he's a self-proclaimed uh, paleocon. Uh, he sees himself in the vein of Patrick Buchanan. Uh, but he has made uh, white nationalist and, and uh, anti-Semitic remarks in the past. We should know uh, Nick Fuentes because um, uh, he supported and uh, encouraged those who listened to him uh, on his show to attend the Capitol siege. Uh, one of the things uh, he is quoted as saying once, and I'll just share this quote, right? Republicans just screwed us every day for two months straight. Nick Fuentes said, um, and he said, we have no recourse. He went on to say, um, what are you going to do to them? What can you do uh, to, to state legislators? And then he says, kill them. Uh, he said this during a live stream aired on a youth targeted site. Uh, and this was just a few days prior to the insurrection uh, at the Capitol. He, of course, and his lawyers say that uh, he wasn't calling for the killing of state legislators. Uh, but he goes on to say, um, we should not do that. I'm not advising that, Fuentes goes on to say. But he then says, but I mean, what else can you do, right? Nothing. Uh, Nick Fuentes 
And his American First show uh, is seen as one of the key seminal uh, voices of the alt-right and uh, the white nationalist movement that is heavily involved in it. That is Nick Fuentes. This guy is a piece of work. And he, uh, how he, he was at the January 6th insurrection. Um, he wasn't arrested, but um, he was certainly an instigator, clearly. Uh, you know, th th that's just, you read some of what he said. Um, he is uh, clearly someone that is an agitator. That, and some of these America First people were arrested now, we found out. They're part of the, the FBI sweeps. And, um, you know, they're part of this other, you know, group of, Oath Keepers and the Boogaloo Boys and the Proud Keepers and these people who believe in violence to get what they want. Um, he's a Holocaust denier, is my understanding as well, um, and a homophobe. And he has no respect for authority. Um, I came across a video of him outside of CPAC because he got thrown out, as we showed in that video. He went over to CPAC and was a rabble rouser there, and they, they, they threw him out of there. Um, and after he left, he went outside to some of his uh, admirers. And uh, this is what happened with that. At Outback, we don't wear masks. No! no! At Outback, we don't have homosexuals speaking on the no! No, 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 no. At Outback, it's America first. No! No! America first, baby. Well, I got to get out of here. They're going to arrest me. Yeah, uh, so much for um, Black the Blue. Yeah, so much yeah. for Black the Blue. Uh, 140 law enforcement officers injured uh, on Capitol Hill on January 6th. Mm -hmm. We see why. That's right. Sure. Rick? Uh, you know, it, it's tempting to dismiss guys like Fuentes as, you know, grubby little opportunists or, or scummy, you know, incels. But this is now a mainstream part of the Trump coalition. They are, the, you know, a lot of these guys operate on a theory that they call no enemies to the right. And so you may see the CPAC people go, oh, we can't have Nick in the room. But there's a real change in the way that a guy like that is treated, whereas, you know, look, in 1984, Ronald Reagan went on stage at CPAC and tore the skin off of David Duke. And in it, when I worked for President George H.W. Bush, guys like me were dispatched down to Louisiana to beat David Duke by working for a Democrat because, as they said at the time, vote for the crook. It's important. The crook wasn't David Duke. The crook was Edwin Edwards, the guy who got elected. But this is a era now where, where a guy like Fuentes has a following, where the, 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 the elimination of the friction in social media has allowed him to amass a following and to, to go out there and be able to fund this kind of thing that he's doing right now. And the fact is, you know, there are a lot of people struggling very hard to cancel anyone who doesn't support Trump. But there are very few people on the Trump side looking at a guy like Fuentes, looking at guys like Charles Johnson, looking at guys like Paul Gosar, and going, hey, we've got to cut this out. We've got to stop this. This is, this is a cancer eating the party. They really don't care anymore. It's become a, it's become, it's not fully mainstream yet, but it's, it's reached the point now where they're not even very embarrassed about it. It's true. It's, we are getting to a point where, um, the difference between CPAC and the American First, uh, the AFPAC conference that was taking place down the road, is almost becoming a distinction without a difference. I mean, at mm -hmm. CPAC this year, what, what you saw uh, was the embrace of, of QAnon. Uh, and right down the road, what you were watching was the, the embrace of white nationalism. We, we should be clear, though, uh, Conservatives, uh, or let's be clear, those who claim to be conservative at CPAC, uh, who have dominated uh, and allowed space for white nationalism inside the Republican Party, had the perfect opportunity. Every single leader was through CPAC this weekend. They could have put out a resolution uh, 
Terra and Rick sure. condemning the conference down the road. And I right. uh, chose not to. Instead, they leaned into uh, QAnon, right? And into the, the fake rhetoric uh, around stolen elections. Meanwhile, down at the American First PAC conference, they were getting each other pumped to run folks for local and state office. If Representative Gosar had spoken at that event in 2015, the Republican Party would have censored him. They would have penalized right. him. And what sure. we see in 2021 is uh, uh, a nod and uh, back to attacking uh, folks on the left. The American First Party and Nick Fuentes are so extreme. Let's not forget that he encouraged his followers to disrupt Turning Point USA in a feud that he had with Charlie Kirk <laughs> um, back Jeez. in the day. This is uh, the American First Pack. It's it's a it's like the brown shirts back in Nazi in you know the Nazi era. This is what it you know what it looks like, and uh, except they're Brooks Brothers in Brooks Brothers suits, you know. And it's um, we have to pay attention to this because these these guys, um, if they are not if this if they're not pushed back into the fringe, and this becomes more mainstreamed, we're going to see more January sixth sixth type events in this country which mm -hmm. I, I don't think enough people are really um, saying plainly. I wish the FBI director would have said something like that today instead of kind of skipping around it. And others who are, you know, in this space, uh, you were saying it, Eric, and we're grateful for what your, your work and what others are saying um, in, in that space, but in law enforcement and national security, they have got to start warning the American people about what's going on here because these guys could be your son's frat brother or, you know, your next door neighbor's kid, you know, this, these guys aren't the, you know, the skinheads and what we think of as the, uh, the stereotypical white supremacists anymore. Um, they are, they look like Nick Fuentes and they look like Congressman Paul Gozar, who, how he is not censored, you know, um, kicked out of his committees for his role directly in this insurrection with the, as we saw in the, in the, in the, um, clip beforehand, before we got to you. <laughs> This guy was directly involved in this, and yet he hasn't been kicked off of any committees. He's kind of skated by. Um, I want to play a clip of some of the things that he said um, at this at this AFPAC. Despite all the attacks, the subversive officials, President Trump made America strong, and I'm a proud supporter of President Trump, and continue to support his America First agenda. To date, President Trump's greatest offense to the ruling class is his allegiance to the hardworking men and women across America, supposed to be the, not, suppo not opposed or opposed to the corporate or global interests. Just to give some context of why we showed that particular clip was because of the Star of David that was, that was projected there. This under, this underbelly of, of anti-Semitism that runs through this whole movement is something that also should not be ignored. And you talk a lot about this, Eric, um, uh, the, the juxtaposition of anti-Semitism, these extremist movements, and how this isn't really new. This is something that we have seen throughout history as part of these conspiracy theories and these um, these these dangerous movements in these authoritarian movements in America, and now it's bubbling up again. Talk a little bit about why this is significant. It is. We we have to understand that this white nationalist element uh, sees themselves in an existential war against Jews. They don't blame black people uh, for the victories of the 1960s civil rights movement, right? Uh, uh, that would be too easy. That would be too rational. Uh, instead, the white nationalist movement has created this false narrative that goes along with their other conspiracy theories that somehow they lost to a Jewish conspiracy and uh, that black people and, and gays and lesbians and, you know, everyone else who uh, they don't get along with are merely puppets of this conspiracy. Anti-Semitism is so core to white nationalism uh, in the same way. Uh, that uh, it is the oxygen. You, you really can't have white nationalism in America 
uh, that is absent of, of anti-Semitism. It is this hatred of Jews uh, that drives it. So you see the imagery, whether you hear them talking about globalist or you know, the uh, Beltway elite, or uh, you see signs such as the Star of David or language like alien. Uh, these are typically code words uh, used uh, to signal uh, to other anti-Semites, uh, right, that they're talking about Jews. Um, well, you know, ahead, the, 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 the refrain of the, you know, the rootless cosmopolitans, of, of, of the, the manipulators behind the scenes, of the masterminds, of the aliens, of these people that that are so in control of everything under the surface. I mean, folks, this stretches back to the Middle Ages. Yeah. This is not new. And and every time it gets rolled up again, it ends badly. And 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 while a lot of Republicans used to say, oh, we, we strongly support Israel, we you know, we're there, you found a lot more people in Trump's era who they they paid lip service to Israel um, because of uh, two things. Sheldon Adelson was a was the largest single donor to Trump, and he had a lot of checklist items that Trump was going to listen to. But you, you, what you saw was an alliance with Saudi Arabia, um, not exactly best friends, not exactly BFFs, and, and a bastion of of of, of anti anti semitism. So a, a lot of what you're seeing here, these things have iterated out across history, and this element of the white supremacist part of the Trump base, um, making the Jews enemy number one, to doing it once again, you know, it ranges from the absurd to the pernicious. Like the Jewish space laser would have been very familiar in the pages of Der Sturmer if they'd had space lasers at the time. Um, right. But, but these things play out over and over again. And the, the biggest thing you'll see these nationalists say is no dual alliances. You've got to have one alliance, one faith only. Well, these people don't have dual alliances. They have faith to an alien ideology that is that is authoritarian and anti-Semitic, not that is pro- profoundly and fundamentally American. But I, I do want to say one it's other not- quick thing. If there's a Nick Fuentes, Charlie Kirk beef, this is like the opposite of a rap beef. It's the two softest white boys in America fighting each other. <laughs> it it oh, tells you goodness. a little bit about the self-destruction of, of this movement. And this is why law enforcement has to take it uh, seriously, right? It, it will uh, destroy itself. It will destroy everyone around it. And uh, it will destroy our country uh, if we let it. And, um, you know, right now, uh, watching these folks uh, fight each other in this uh, beef, as as you frame it, uh, should be a sign to us, right? Just how incredibly nihilistic, right, and egotistically driven uh, this white nationalist movement, this alt right movement, this this age of Trumpism, uh, it's it's selfish. It's not grounded in some core American values of. Uh, being neighbors, of, of being generous, of actually caring uh, about the place we, we live in. And uh, so we have to be vigilant, uh, but we need law enforcement to, to be extremely vigilant. And law enforcement is being um, mm-hmm. uh, uh, still, I think, not taking this as seriously as it should be, despite the insurrection right. on January 6th, despite the bombing that occurred in Nashville, despite 140 law enforcement officers injured and other events. Mm -hmm. Um, Look, uh, I think we all know uh, that part of this is is our work. It's not law enforcement. It's about making a message to the American public about the danger of white nationalism. Uh, But we need law enforcement to do its part when people are out there breaking the law uh, and threatening elected officials in our democracy. Well, the good news is that this administration is actually taking this seriously and recently committed uh, $77 million, I believe, to local law enforcement to help with these efforts on a local level. So it starts, it flows from the head. We had four years of an administration that wouldn't even utter the words about domestic uh, terrorism, right-wing domestic terrorism, similar to the way Republicans used to criticize Obama and the Democrats about not 
identifying radical Islamic terrorism, right? They used to say, say the words, you have to know the enemy that you're fighting. Well, the tables have been turned now, and now they're acting the same way um, with a real threat here. And domestic terrorism has c- killed more people since 9-11 than any you know, radical Islamic terrorism here on, on uh, American soil. Uh, but you don't really hear them talking about that too much because they don't want to admit it because unfortunately these are their people. Um, before we let you go, Eric, I wanted to yeah. bring up uh, a piece that you wrote recently that I found fascinating and I hope that people go and read it. It's called Conspiracy Theories Are Killing Us, America. And you talk about an experience you had 25 years ago walking into a Holocaust denier conference out there on the West Coast. And you, you realize that 25 years later that there is a through line from that um, conference that you went to and this what we were just talking about, the Holocaust and I and anti-Semitism to the big conspiracies that are dominating our culture right now. Um, the big lie coming out of Donald Trump and the sure. uh, election being stolen and things also around coronavirus and, and you know, QAnon, um, what happened in Texas. Uh, you know, these are all things that are centered around this this conspiracy theory um, problem that we have now in this country, that it's been mainstreamed. And you say that the dangers of mainstreaming conspiracy theories in America, that it's time to face facts, that the mainstreaming of these conspiracy theories is no longer merely a war of words or a question of ideological differences. It's a deadly phenomenon that is costing lives. Um, Yes. Just talk a little bit about about that, and then um, we'll let you go. Yeah, in the 80s and 90s, there was a big push by the far right and the white nationalist movement to sanitize uh, World War II. And, and to really, um, the problem was, they were having a problem mainstreaming themselves because the world was aware of the Holocaust and the, uh, uh, cons- the intent, right, to to kill all of European Jewry and um, during World War II. And this was a hard moral line for them to get over. They couldn't come right out and just say uh, it didn't happen, which is the conspiracy they were arguing. So they began to create what I called lighter arguments that gave weight to the big lie, right? The big lie to them was that six to eight million Jews didn't die uh, in Europe during World War II because of the Holocaust. So they began to push at the fringes by saying, well, uh, let's debate how many people died or let's debate whether it was intentional or not. And because most people weren't academics, right, well studied in the Holocaust, they could open up little moments of doubt around whether the Holocaust happened or not. This is what we call Holocaust denial. And in the 1980s and 90s, it was the leading edge. And so I attended a meeting after a a Holocaust scholar by the name of David Irving uh, took a (laughs) well-respected historian, Deborah Lipstadt, to court. He ultimately lost. But it was attending that meeting that I learned a few things that were critically important. The purpose of the big lie isn't really to convince everyone. It's to open up the space of debate, right, to allow us uh, uh, to doubt enough. And it's a form of distraction terror. The, the, the goal of it is to make sure we're not actually debating and talking about the things that matter, that are tangible. And I liken it to like, if you've ever had to clean up a big backyard, right? And five of you get together to do the hard work of cleaning the backyard. The conspiracist is the person who's over in the corner, really focused on what music you're listening to. Right. Right. Not over there rolling up their sleeves and getting to the work uh, that needs to be done. And what's happened with conspiracy theories is is simply just this, that the big lie has been allowed and tolerated by the rest of us. Right. These these kind of circling small doubts that we know um, I was about to say FOS. Right. Meaning. Right. We know there's no substance to them. But they take advantage of our tolerance, right? This idea that we should somehow give space to it. And the giving of space to this has allowed several things. It has allowed over a half a million Americans to die because we have tolerated the conspiracies that have surrounded uh, folks who won't take vaccines or who won't wear masks 
or who feel they can just walk into a store and expose other people. We've climate denial, the idea that we do not have to steward, right, and conserve our lands and resources around us, right, have led us to, to these moments of deregulation, exposure to huge amounts of wildfires. It is these big lies. Right, the stolen elections that allowed people to physically attack and assault uh, government right. employees. Right, this is the big lie, and the big lie is not just a good story or a funny story or a ridiculous story. It is actually now resulting in policy that's that's injuring all of us. Right, and and sure. people are dying from it. And you you make a really good point. You say. In the white nationalist space, you say white nationalist strat uh, strategists understand that if they can remove the barrier, that barrier of the the morality and horror of uh, the immorality and horror of like something like the Holocaust, if they can if they can just start to ask questions and little things and remove that barrier of morality, then they would face less backlash to their authoritarian aims. So the bottom sure. line there is if they can just mainstream it, get enough people to start questioning then the authoritarian um, pathway that they're going down becomes less nefarious. And that's what we need to worry about here, because when authoritarianism is elevated, it's at the expense of democracy and freedom. And that is not what America stands for. Eric Ward, thank you so much for your brilliance on this thank issue. You. Thanks, Eric. I hope people Great follow always, you and read your friend. work. And um, we'll see you soon. Thank you, Lincoln Project. Thank you, Breakdown. It's great to see you both. Eric is amazing. Um, so good. Please read his work. So it's uh, fascinating, fascinating stuff. All right. Um, I think that we had a couple tweets for him, but it's uh, we have to get to our next guest. So we will hold off on those tweets and get them when we have Jen. So our next guest tonight, we're going to talk a little bit about, actually, before I, well, no, I'm going to bring Jen in for, for this because I want to show something kind of funny from that, <laughs> from that ridiculous conference we saw. Um, our next guest is another friend of the show, a friend of mine, a brilliant woman who I adore and love reading her work. And if you have not gotten her book, you should, Demagogue for President. Um, Jennifer authored the book, like I said, Jennifer, um, demagogue for president, and she is an assistant professor of communication at Texas A&M. She is a historian of political rhetoric and has been analyzing Trump's use of rhetoric since, God bless her, 2015. Um, Jen, welcome back. Jennifer Mershia, we love you. Happy to have you. My pleasure to be here. Thank you so much for having me back. And you also have one of my favorite backgrounds. I love that color scheme. Um, Thank you. Jennifer, it's a 10 out of 10. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. You're, you're, everyone's looking at a couple 10 out of 10s on Room Raider. I think, uh, Rick, you got one too, didn't you, at one point? Maybe not for that one. It was one with Nameless in the background, right? You got three, three. 10 out of 10s? Oh, Man. I do too. I wasn't going to brag, but okay. We're all winners here. <laughs> We're all I got winners. deuces. I got to change my scene. <laughs> yeah. Get it up. Get it up. Oh, my gosh. So, um, Jen, you, like us, you're a glutton for punishment. You actually sat through that Trump speech at CPAC, waiting with bated breath like the rest of the world. Um, but I want to show something before we get into Trump. This was what was going on outside of that AFPAC. One of our favorite villains, Roger Stone, was, was there. A recently pardoned Roger Stone was out there hanging around CPAC at the AFPAC stuff. And uh, let's just take a look at this video. Who won Trump won? Who won Trump won? Watermark the baddest 45, the chosen one. It is great to be in Florida where you guys are normal, you're open, I don't have to wear a mask anymore. That's so much better than California. There's nothing more under attack today than women's sports. Math is now racist. South Dakota is the only state in America that never ordered a single business or church to close. <laughs> Donald Trump said it's time to throw the grenades and charge at the enemy. This unconstitutional power grab on elections. The only city in America named after a gun. It looks like they, they 
casted everybody out of the Che Guevara uh, catalog or something. Turning those schools into indoctrination camps for the left. They don't want you to be able to protect yourself. They don't want you to have freedom of speech. They don't want you to have freedom of religion. They are the party of no. We are saying no. We are saying a big hell no to all of their no's. She said, hey, Vernon, you, got, you have my gun? You have my gun, don't you? I said, yeah, Mom, what are you going to do with the gun? Well, I just want my gun just in case somebody come up in this nursing home. I want to start blowing away. You know the fans did the sweet. They was knocking at the front door. Patriots pulling up, knocking on the Capitol. <laughs> American political discourse at its finest is what I saw there. <laughs> oh my gosh. I mean the absurdity of it all. It's just uh you have to laugh to stop from crying. Um so Jennifer, when you when you were watching CPAC and watching um a lot of what these people were talking about, I mean there was a it was a rhetorical um potpourri of bullshit but also some things that are they're using if they were telegraphing some of the themes and and rhetorical techniques they're going to use going into 2022 what stood out for for you the most yeah i love um the word you use absurd uh because i think that for the average american who's not a part of um the right wing media ecosystem and doesn't live in the q world um i think that you know watching the clips you put out or trying to watch those speeches, I think it does seem absurd. Um, I think that it doesn't make any sense. You know, uh, <laughs> most of us in America um, don't live within that reality, that discourse community. And, and so what I saw there um, was them not trying to persuade, you know, all of America to agree with anything that they might say, but really speaking um, internally um, to their own already committed people. And when you speak to those folks, um, you don't have to talk about policy. You know, it's not a, a time for that. Um, it's really an occasion that that isn't about persuasion so much as it's about rallying the troops. And so what you saw um, in those clips that you, you gave were so great, you know, were all about us versus them polarization. They were all about, you know, reaffirming that we are the good guys, that they are the bad guys. They are organized. They are determined. They're trying to take away our rights, um, whether they're gun rights or whether they're, you know, the right to go without a mask or whatever it is. You know, there's a whole menu of things that, um, you know, the CPAC and, and right wing of America would like for um, for us to believe that, you know, other people are determined to to rob and steal and, and take away freedoms. And, um, and, and, and it's, it's, it's not, it's not reality. <laughs> and so it is absurd. Right. Um, and there's rhetorical theories about that, which I could actually tell you if you're, <laughs> if you want more. Yes. Yes. What are the rhetorical theories on that? Because I think okay. people just look okay. at this and they say, this is absurd, but there is actually science behind but this, believe it or not. There, there is. So Aristotle um, said that you want to argue by example and by enthymeme. So we know what examples are. Um, you want to you know, give lots of examples to make your speech vivid right? so that people can connect to it. Enthymemes are what people in a specific discourse community, for Aristotle, it was a, a city-state, uh, what those people know to be true, real, um, the assumptions that they already have. And so for Aristotle, um, you wouldn't state those assumptions because that would be redundant and unnecessary, but you would want to make arguments that were based on those assumptions, right? And so you wouldn't uh, say the major premise of the syllogism. You wouldn't say all men are mortal. You would instead just say Socrates is a man and assume that your audience understood that that means that Socrates is mortal. Um, and he called that a rhetorical syllogism or an enthymeme. Um, and what is fascinating to me when I watch something like CPAC is to see how the enthymemes in that community make very little sense to me. And so if you watch Twitter um, <laughs> over the weekend, it was really just people like laughing and pointing because it was so absurd. Right. Um, right. But for the people who live in that community, that's what they expect. That is reality for them. Um, and that's what makes me so concerned about the state of American political discourse, frankly. Um, you know, obviously, I think that the right wing um, and the right wing extremists in particular are a huge threat. And they are definitely a part of influencing 
that discourse community. But the fact that we have these, um, you know, radically different discourse communities that can't understand one another, that, you know, think that the opposition is absurd um, and that, you know, everything Mm -hmm. they say is a lie, um, you know, it really makes me worry about where we're headed as a nation. Or that the opposition is an enemy. Go ahead, Rick. Exactly. Yeah, I, I do think, I mean, we've lost the we've lost the the idea in this country that there are that there are intellectual constructs to debate and to push back and forth and try to arrive at some sort of middle ground or compromise or 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 or, or, or that the rationality that was the hallmark of the Enlightenment would lead us to conclusions. Now it has become, I, I think. This very emotional and very base sort of uh, rhetorical style on the right, which is stoke the amygdala, push the fear, um, constantly, uh, you know, portray any opposition as evil, um, portray any disagreement as fundamentally wrong. Uh, and I think it, I, I almost feel like the toolbox we have for describing some of these things has not been exercised in this country in a very, very long time, now, probably not since the Civil War. At this at this degree, would you agree with that, Jennifer? Yeah, I would. And um, absolutely right, what you said. And it reminds me actually of um, what happened between the first and second generations in the United States um, in terms of debating our political theory. So, you know, um, first generation of Americans under the Constitution were almost constantly debating what form of government we had, um, whether it was a republic, whether it was a democracy, how democratic it would be you know, um, those kinds of things. Every policy that came up was really a question about political theory. Um, And what happened during the second generation, and this starts, you know, with Andrew Jackson, really, is that instead of debating political theory, we assume the political theory is settled. We start to call our nation a democracy instead of a republic, even though the constitutional design is, you know, to be a republic. And we just declare that democracy is now good, and we have one. Um, And so then people stop debating what it means to have a democracy. They stop debating what is a republic, whether, you know, which form is government is better. Um, And and really, it takes away a lot of the ability to um, to to grow and to change, you know, and to really think about what we want as a nation and whether the policies that we choose, you know, will help us to achieve those goals. And de Tocqueville was fascinated by all of this when he came to America and wrote his book. <laughs> um, he did. And, he did. Yeah. <laughs> um, the Tocqueville thing a, is a scam, by the way. I don't know no, if y'all know this, but um, no, the Federalist it, Party totally shammed like Tocqueville. Like everywhere he went, people were like, all right, act correct. Nobody tell him anything. <laughs> like it's in all right. the papers at the time. They're like, this guy That's is cool. coming. <laughs> That's interesting. It's kind of like today. Right. <laughs> very, very Potemkin <laughs> village. <laughs> yeah. Performative politics, right? Um, yeah. Let's take a tweet, a couple tweets uh, since we have you, Jim. Let us let's tweet. Let's see what we got. All right. Uh, Elizabeth Keaton, how can the false inflammatory rhetoric that is being generated by Cruz et al. be successfully countered? That's a good question. How do we counter the bullshit, Professor Mashia? It is a great question, and I wish I had a great answer for you. It's really difficult to puncture this discourse community, right? So because most people outside of it don't speak the language and can't access the inside, you know, sphere, um, it's difficult to sort of pierce the whole thing, right? And to be like, expose him. Um, because anything that you you do is going to be treated as a, a tukokwe, which is an appeal to hypocrisy, right? It's going to be treated as like, you know, y- you don't have good motives for this criticism. Like there's nothing pure about what you're doing. You're just out to get us, you know, all of the things that you would say to dismiss it, right? Motivated reasoning would, would use that. And, um, and, and, you know, cynicism, right? And so, like, for example, with the Can Cruz thing, um, you know, it wasn't like he had done something wrong. It was, oh, what's wrong with AOC and Beto O'Rourke, like, for raising all that money to make him look bad? Right. Right? Like, it's absolutely an appeal to hypocrisy there um, and, and really based on cynicism. So it's very difficult to pierce that bubble. 
Um, but what is much more easier to do is to have one-on-one -on -one conversations with people you know who might be crew supporters or who might be um, you know, Republicans in sympathy or, or voters and, um, sure. and talk to them, you know, as a person, like not as a political entity. Um, but it's, it's interpersonal persuasion that that's really going to make the difference because you have those bonds of trust that can, um, you know, transcend in theory, partisanship. In theory, you know, that's been the challenge and that's been the common denominator when we get asked this question a lot because a lot of our, our Lincoln Project supporters, they run up against this, you know, and they sure. may not be as well versed as some of us are in political theory and rhetoric and history and the facts of what's going on every day. They're just regular Americans that know absurdity and BS when they see it. But they these are people that are in their family, their friend, their best friends, their neighbors that they're unrecognizable to them now all of a sudden within this era of Trump. And they just don't know how to combat it. When now these people are arguing that the sky is purple and the sun rises in the West. So it that, you know, the um, we had uh, uh, Stephen Hassan on uh, a couple of weeks ago about, you know, the, the cult expert and how to get out of it. And he was similar thing that you have to try to establish personal use that personal relationship quotient to try and break through it because because you're never going to get them with facts or trying to recite historical facts. It's not going to matter. It has to be that personal relationship, which sometimes no. it doesn't work. It's tough. You're right. Nope. Let's take another tweet. All right. Stuart Smith, isn't there a way that America first can be hijacked from the Trumpsters and used by the Democrats against them? Uh, Rick, my, my vote here on this is that <laughs> that would be wonderful, but I think that that brand has potentially been ruined a little bit because America first doesn't, didn't just start now. That goes back to even, you know, Nazi era times where that phrase was used. Well, it was, it was part of the German, of America, the German American Bund used the phrase right. America first as right. a rhetorical trope to allow Hitler to continue to, to, to arm and, and begin the, the conquest of Europe. And so, you know, these folks that are doing this are the spiritual descendants of that Bund. They are rhetorically going to embrace something that is embedded with both an ideological and a racial component to it. Because what they're really saying is not America first, they're saying white European America first. And, and, and it's, it's a backdoor way for them to communicate that idea that I think is very, um, it, it's hard to recapture that phrase at this point. Um, yeah. But you, you might capture it as America. I rewatched. I rewatched Trump's uh, 2013 CPAC speech, which was only 15 minutes. And do you know that he actually mm -hmm. said white American or white Europeans? He's like, why don't we let the white Europeans into the country? I have friends and they can't get in. Of course he did. Of course he, he did. Said it. Uh, of course he said he it's did. not popular to say this. <laughs> uh, well, apparently it was more popular to say it because he got himself elected freaking president three years, three short years later. And imagine if we only had to sit through 15 minutes of a Trump speech today. Uh, right, now it's we like all castro 90 minute rants. <laughs> Good God. Um, and speaking of that, Jennifer, before I let you go, I have to ask you what you thought of Trump's speech. I mean, it was an 88 minute rambling mess. Most of it was just a rehash of his grievances, but there were some parts of that that I found to be really alarming. But for you as a, a Trump rhetoric expert here, and uh, Rick, I also noticed the demagogue for president hat there in the background. Nice. Um, <laughs> that good, nice support. Um, <laughs> as, the, uh, as the Trump w rhetoric whisperer here, what, what stood out to you? Um, you know, I think probably the most newsworthy thing was when he said that he wasn't going to start his own party, um, you know, just because if you recall in 2015, the first question at the first Republican primary debate was, you know, will everyone absolutely promise that, you know, they will support the nominee? And you remember Trump was like, mm, I probably won't right. unless it's me. Um, and so for him to say, you know, unequivocally, it, you know, I don't know if I trust him, but for him to say unequivocally that he's not going to start his own party, I think that's probably the only news. 
Um, but otherwise, you know, you saw him doing the same strategies that he's done repeatedly. It was not a very newsworthy speech. Um, very much using the ad populum appeal, appealing to his base, the wisdom of his base, always good, best of America, all of that kind of stuff. Um, you know, a really sort of startling but not surprising um, ad baculum threat of force was when he named all of his, um, you know, his enemies uh, list, disloyal, yeah, enemies who didn't support him. Um, you know, that's of course to be expected. Uh, a lot of hyperbole, the use of the big lie again, you know, sort of relitigating um, what he believes to be or wants us to believe to be uh, his victory in 2020. Um, you know, so I, I saw him doing things that he has always done. Um, I didn't think it was a very interesting speech. I had um, a few excerpts of it that a reporter had given to me. And so actually the thing that I found most interesting was that the way that he ad-libbed um, against the text. So, you know, he said things like, well, the future of the Republican Party is diverse and is to support America's workers, um, you know, and their cultural diversity and whatnot. And then he sort of heard himself say it. And he was like, ah, uh, and the party is changing and it's full of love. <laughs> that wasn't in the speech. That wasn't, that wasn't written for him. <laughs> yes. Yeah, Steve, um, Stephen Miller doesn't know how to write the word love. He, he you know, it's like kryptonite. He, he can't do it. <laughs> and I thought that was interesting because it really sounded, you know, that chunk that was written for him sounded like the 2012, you know, postmortem that the GOP party did that said, you know, we need right. to be a big tent party. That's right. We need to really. And so he was he was written to give that moment, like to give that speech. And um, he rejected it after he said it. You, you so, can you what? can always feel you can always feel the fist of the writer in in these speeches. Now, that was mostly a Miller production, but I suspect. Mm -hmm. Kellyanne had a look at it. I suspect Jared yep. Ivanka had a look at it. And they wanted to soften it up and smooth it out a little bit because they still believe that teleprompter Trump is the real Trump. But as I've told people since 2015, the real Trump is in the asides. The real Trump is in yep. the off script moment. The real Trump is That's right. Because look, even the tough rhetoric in the in the in the speech. Uh, caravans are coming and MS-13 and Antifa. <laughs> what he really believes when he starts talking about it off the script is that's where the crazy door starts to creak open and where the things get really wild. Um, and and I'm, I'm sure for better or for worse, Jennifer, we will be having you back again on the show as Donald Trump begins his long path to his 2024 mm. re-election campaign. Uh, in, indeed. And, and but, but uh, Rick, you forgot, Donald Trump Jr. spent three hours. I spent three hours preparing with my father on that speech. So I just want to say a couple <laughs> things, just real quick. As a speechwriter, <sighs> as a speechwriter, and as a guy who's done a lot of speech and debate prep for very serious, you know, national events, if you spent three hours on that speech, I am the queen of the May, all right? If you spent three hours on that speech, I miss fucking America. Donald Trump looked at that speech about 30 seconds before he walked on stage and went, hmm, and read it off the prompter, except for the voices in his head that were, the, that were saying, right. now, Donald, now, Donald, follow us <laughs> into the darkness. <laughs> Uh, well, we're going to have to have another expert on and talk about the voices in Donald Trump's head. But <laughs> we're thankful to have <laughs> Professor Jennifer Mercia on with us to talk about the voices that come out of his mouth. Jennifer, thank, thank you, you Jennifer. so much for joining us. Be sure to pleasure. read her book. See you next time. Uh, Demagogue for President. Um, it's, it's a fascinating read and you will uh, learn a little bit more about that crazy guy. Um, hopefully we don't hear so much more from him. All right, Jennifer, thank you so much. We'll have you back. Thank you. Have a great night. You too. I'm always smarter after conversations with her. I, I just adore her. She's the best. Perfect. All right. Um, so uh, for our call to action tonight as we end the show, um, we talked earlier in the show about the insanity happening now in Texas and Mississippi with the governors deciding to lift the masking orders and um, the, the social distancing orders and opening things up as if there's not a pandemic. Folks, there is still a pandemic, a deadly one taking place right now. Now is not the time to let down your guard. So our call to action tonight is to continue to be vigilant, wear your mask, 
socially distant. Be smart about this. Even if you have gotten your vaccine, you still have to continue with your responsible COVID behavior because there's still a possibility of transmission to others. So get your right. vaccine if you can, continue to mask and continue to be a good citizen. Do not, please do not get um, complacent about this or let up because we are far from out of the woods. We're on our way. There is good news. The cavalry has arrived, but we have not gotten through this just yet. So, but we will, as long as we are responsible and we do it together. So that is our call to action tonight. Uh, we're with you. Believe me, we're all sick of it too. We have the you know COVID fatigue, but we're almost there. Let's not uh, do things that, that set us back. So we're in this with you too. And We'll be back on Thursday night at our regular time. As always, Thursdays at 9 p.m. live, we'll be back to talk about disinformation. Uh, Professor Brian Rosenwald, University of Pennsylvania, will be joining us. He also wrote a book about Talk Radio America, which was uh, a really fascinating read, if you haven't read it, about the, uh, the influence of talk radio and how that ecosystem from talk radio helped build Fox News and how we got what we have now, which is basically a <laughs> propaganda channel on, on the right and, and all of the ancillary uh, channels of communication that came from that. It's fascinating because disinformation is another threat to our democracy. So be sure to tune in on Thursday night to us and check out our sister show tomorrow night. We're speaking at 9 p.m. here on LP TV with Lisa Senecal and Maya May. If you are not following them on Twitter, please follow them and follow us at LP TV on the LP TV Twitter feed where you can find all of our clips and our schedules of our show. Thank you so much for watching and we'll see you on Thursday. Good night, folks. booed at CPAC and you're Ted Cruz like that means that literally there are 8 billion people on this planet 7,999,999,000 people loathe you and you're the only person who doesn't everyone wants to be safe in times of uncertainty but even if you follow every precaution exposures remain a real risk to your health Qdroxychloroquine once a day can help reduce that risk if you're suffering from uncontrollable thoughts of democracide, along with a persistent sense that cannibalistic satanic pedophiles are after your phone records, you may have been exposed to Ignis Fatis Dolitis, or IFD, a once rare condition that has grown to concerning proportions in recent decades. People who contract IFD may find themselves calling friends and family members cucks in social settings and online, aggressive behavior toward medical masks, or in some cases donning buffalo horns while attacking federal office buildings. Living life can be more than telling people that Alexa is how they get you. The deep state is coming for you. And referring to people you just met online as your circle of friends. Break the imaginary chains of Ignis Fatis Dolitis with Qdroxychloroquine. Some sufferers of IFD may have merged its effects with their personal identity to the degree that oral capsules of Qdroxychloroquine are difficult pills to swallow. Side effects may include clear thinking, improved mood, and generosity of spirit. Some individuals experienced a epiphanies, adherence to their own stated religious precepts, and in rare cases, the ability to do math. Hydroxychloroquine poses no known risks to women who are nursing, pregnant, or may become pregnant. Inform your doctor if you are involuntarily celibate, as the rationalizing effects of hydroxychloroquine
and may interfere with natural selection. Visit our booth at the Conservative Political Action Conference this weekend for more information. And remember, just because no one is after you doesn't mean you're alone. Hey guys, hope you're doing well. Just watching my algorithms get crushed. I guess I did something to piss off the Instagram gods, so hopefully you're seeing this stuff anyway. We'll do what we can. Talk to you soon.